Psalm 127. A Solomonic Song of Ascents. Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labour over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. In vain, you get up early and stay up late, eating food earned by hard work. Certainly he gives sleep to the one he loves. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born in one's youth. Happy is the man who has filled his quiver with them. Such men will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, One of the common feedbacks that I get uh, as I get sermon feedback is, Bernard, your illustrations always seem to have something to do with sport. And uh, that's true because I love sport and so I'm going to maintain my consistency and keep doing that today. Uh, I love thinking about legacy when it comes to sport. Uh, The lasting impression of sportsmen and women on their chosen sport. Uh, Let me begin with my favourite sport, which is running. Uh, Roger Bannister has left an immense legacy. Uh, He's the first man to break the four-minute mile at the University of Oxford one afternoon after a day of lectures. He put his mind to it and ran a four-minute mile or a little under. Now, even high school students in America are managing that feat. But it needed Roger Bannister to do it first. John Landy, uh, his great competitor in Australian, and they met at the Commonwealth Games in a really remarkable race. John Landy's legacy is that he is known for his sportsmanship, uh, the ultimate gentleman who would often stop and help other runners in a race to the detriment of his own results. Herb Elliott, Herb Elliott was never beaten in a mile or 1500 metre race in his whole entire career. And he actually transformed training methods and showed people that you can actually train a lot harder than most people thought. Elliot Kipchoge, my current favourite, he's the first man who ran under two hours for a marathon. Uh, Just go and try that down at the Oval this afternoon for one lap. And he did it for 42 kilometres. But legacy is not just to do with sport, is it? Our legacy is also talked about throughout our whole world. Julie... Julia Childs, what's she remembered for? What's that? Jess Prominence, food, you're right. She transformed home cooking, didn't she? Transformed home cooking, made French cuisine available to the household. Paul Keating, besides the fact that he still lambasts the Labor Party and their dealings with parts of the world, Paul Keating's remembered as the first Prime Minister to say, we're actually part of Asia. And he floated the Australian dollar. Gough Whitlam... Well, Gough Whitlam is inextricably connected to Indigenous land rights and free education. We we could go on, couldn't we? All sorts of parts of life. Our legacy is often talked about in terms of achievements, in terms of policies, in terms of buildings. Uh, What's Jörn Utzen remembered for? Uh, The Opera House, isn't he? I think about some of the houses on the North Coast and some of the big buildings in Sydney, and you think of Glenn Merkett and Francis Greenaway. Even events are described as having a legacy. Think of the Berlin Wall falling. Where were you on that day? What did you do? Do you actually have a piece of it on your mantelpiece? But we often talk about legacy in terms of our children, don't we? They're our legacy. We're leaving them. In fact, God himself talks about this in Genesis chapter 1. He creates man in his image, male and female, and then he gives them a very clear command. What is it? Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth full of little image bearers of God. So today as we finish our series on God God and sex, we're naturally going to talk about children and why they are a legacy. Let me pray. And then we're going to dive into God's word. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you for poets like Solomon who write poems like Psalm 127, which we can really get into if we imagine it and think it. I thank you for the reminder of your legacy and your people's legacy. 
Father, help us to think clearly about that today as we think about your design for children. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Well, I want to start with Psalm 127. Is that going to work, Peter, do you reckon? Beautiful. I want to start with Psalm 127. Uh, As we look at Psalm 127, uh, I want us to remember three simple truths. This will just help us. The Psalms are written over a vast period of time. Moses wrote one of the Psalms and others of the Psalms are written in exile when God's people are being kicked out of the land. But the book itself was put together when God's people came back from exile. They've been kicked out, kicked out of their land. And as they came back, they put together a hymn book of 150 poems that they could use together. Second, this psalm is given to which author? Can you remember from the start when I read it? Uh, It's from Solomon, isn't it? Uh, Solomon was perhaps one of the greatest kings of God's people, only rivaled by his father, King David. Solomon was famous for his buildings, famous for the way in which he built God's temple. Solomon was famous for his wisdom. He was the first scientist who sat down and observed creation and came to conclusions. Solomon was famous for his vast wealth, wasn't he? And Solomon was famous for his vast harem of hundreds of wives and walking away from God. Third, this psalm is one of 15 psalms called Songs of Ascent. And this is a kind of psalm that you would sing as you brought your family to Jerusalem two or three times a year and you sang it as you went up the hill to the temple. Uh, Jerusalem's built on a massive hill and the temple sits smack bang on the top. And as all of God's people stream in, they would sing these songs together. Moms and dads, extended households, all the kids running around and they'd sing these songs as they walked up to the temple. So keep those three truths in mind. So when we read these words, that's what we're thinking about. Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labour over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. In vain you get up early, stay up late, eating food earned by hard work. Certainly he gives sleep to the one he loves. Now you've got to picture the scene. You're walking to Jerusalem, you're coming up that hill and as you lift your eyes, what dominates the whole landscape? It's that temple, it's that building and it takes your breath away. Uh, When you look at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, when you see it on the news, they're the foundation stones of the third temple which was the smallest. If they're the foundation stones of the smallest temple, imagine how big the real temple is. It is ginormous. And the one you're walking up to is tiny compared to the one Solomon built. The one Solomon built had been destroyed and it's now been rebuilt and you sing this song as you walk up and you realise that the only reason that building is still there is why? Because God made sure it would stay there. The only reason that building is there is because God built it. The only reason you can come up that hill is because God brought you back. The only reason you can sing this song is because of the work of God. That's God's legacy. And then as you're looking at that temple, suddenly there's this massive tug on the end of your robes and you look down and there's another little rug rat because your family's walking up with you and they're tumbling and they're rumbling and they're laughing and they're crying and they're hungry and you're all walking up together. There's God's legacy. Here's your legacy. And so that's why I think Solomon, next one please, gentlemen, that's why I think Solomon writes these words. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, children are a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, a son's born in one's youth. Happy is the man who's filled his quiver with them. Such men will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gates. This is your mob. They're yours. They're the ones who look after you in your old age. When you go to the city gate with a lawsuit with your enemy, they'll have your back. They're the ones that are going to carry on your family name and you realise that they only still exist, not because you're a good parent, but because God's been kind and generous. Just like he built that house, so he makes sure this house survives. I mean, it's not an ideal time to go to Jerusalem. Never is, is it? 
And the crops have to come in. Someone's got to look after the livestock. You've still got contracts to fulfil in your carpentry business. The timing's always hard, but you go. And as you go, you're reminded that God builds the house. He builds that house and he builds this house. That temple and your family are his legacy. And by his work, they are your legacy. It's helpful to remember that. I'm at point three on the outline. It's helpful to remember that because Psalm 127 gives us a number of pointers to key truths about God's design for children. God's design for children is hinted at in this psalm. Next slide, please, Tim. Children are a gift from God. Children are born, and they're born into what seems to be a family in Psalm 127, and that was God's design right from the beginning, that children be born into a family. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Next slide. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, every creature that crawls on the earth. God made male and female. Then he gave them a command, be fruitful and multiply, and children are to be created within that design within the marriage of one man and one woman for life to the exclusion of all others. So by the time we get to the end of Genesis 2, we see that a man leaves his own home to start a new family. And within that family, children will come. Children are also described as image bearers. Next slide, please, Tim. From Genesis chapter 5, Adam was 130 years old when he fathered a child in his likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Adam lived 800 years after the birth of Seth and he fathered sons and daughters. Adam was created in the image of God. His likeness is the image of God and he passes that on to his kids. He doesn't just pass on his eyebrows and his nose and his eye colour, he passes on the image of God. Every child is a little image bearer of God. Every child is a little image bearer of God. And that design lies right throughout the whole Bible. It's there in the book of Proverbs as a father talks to his son about life. It sits behind you and your children that we heard in Deuteronomy 6 and in Exodus as God's people leave slavery and come into freedom. It stands there in Ephesians and Colossians when children are talked to in church. And it sits in the language of people's response to the good news of Jesus in Acts 2 when you and your children can be saved. That's God's design. But we know God's design is broken because who wrote Psalm 127? Solomon. And what happened to Solomon, the wisest man in the world, given wisdom from God, entrusted by God with the ability to build his house? What happened to Solomon? Here here are the words at the end of Solomon's life from God. Solomon, I am going to tear this kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Wouldn't that be horrific to have on your headstone? Because Solomon had wandered away from God. Solomon had decided he knew better than God. And that brokenness doesn't start with Solomon, does it? It starts with the very first family. I've said this before, the first family in the world is the first dysfunctional family. You can't avoid it, can you? I know we get tired of hearing this, but it's an inescapable truth. It helps us understand life. Adam and Eve decided they knew better than God. Uh, They sinned and they received the right judgment of God in their family. Genesis 3.16, the relationships are broken. Genesis 3.18, work is now broken. And when Adam passes on likeness to his son, he's not just passing on the likeness of God. What else is he passing on? He's passing on the likeness of sin. His kids are born with hearts turned against God. Children, as image bearers, are sinful. And that truth is recognised right throughout the Bible, but perhaps greatest in this verse from Psalm 51, verse 5. Tim, Psalm 51, verse 5. David writes this psalm. 
At the moment, he's confronted with his sin of adultery, murder, and corruption. And he recognizes this about himself. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful from when my mother conceived me. Sin is there in the first family. Cain kills Abel. And the dysfunction spreads. So by the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, God says, every inclination of the heart of man is evil. God's design, broken, but God alone builds. And so God alone is going to do something about this broken design. That's one of the central truths of Psalm 127. Left to our own devices, we'd just leave train wrecks all over the world, wouldn't we? But God steps in. He promises that back there in Genesis 3.15. One of your kids, Eve, will kill the snake. He promises that when he grabs Abraham and says that through his family he'll reverse the curse on the world. Genesis 12.1-3. It was passed on to Abraham's family there at Mount Sinai when God gave them a job of showing God to the world. Exodus 19. God made that promise to David when he said that one of David's boys would be God's boys, 2 Samuel 7, and God would establish a legacy forever. God made that promise in Hosea 11 when he describes his own people as children and says, I will fix you up. And God did it, didn't he? When he sent a member of his own family, if you like, one of himself, his son, into the world to restore it. Jesus bears the image of God, Colossians 2, verse 9. Jesus represents God perfectly, never sinning. Jesus lives, dies, and rises for our sin so that the image of God can be put back on us truly, Colossians 3. And it's striking that Jesus says that work is available for anyone. Tim, next one, Matthew chapter 19. Then children were brought to him so he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. Then Jesus said, leave the kids alone. Don't try to keep them from coming to me because the kingdom of heaven is made up of people like this. After putting his hands on them, he went on from there. Who can come to Jesus to be forgiven? Oh, we can have a next phase conference and deal with those over 50. And those who are under five months can have their hearts restored in Jesus, can't they? Anyone can come to Jesus and be restored and call God Father. And who alone will do that? God will build the house. God will do that in his son Jesus. So here we are, point four on the outline. Here are our reminders of three great truths about children. First, God's design for children is for them to be born in, raised in families of his design. As image bearers of God and image bearers of Adam and Eve, children are sinners by nature. Third, God alone is the one who can restore any person through his son alone, Jesus Christ. So what does this look like practically? Well, you'll see on your outline there some suggestions. I I want to just work through this fairly quickly. What is the greatest need a child has? What is the greatest need a child has? The greatest need any child has is forgiveness of sins. That flies in the face of so much in our world today. The greatest need a child has is, oh, you could fill that up with all sorts of words, couldn't you? The right to an education, the need of a stable family, the opportunity for success. Now, they are all wonderful things. But the greatest need a child has is that their hearts need to be turned back to God through Jesus Christ alone. Left on their own, a child's heart is like any human heart and we know where that leads. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. A child's greatest need is the forgiveness of sins and a heart turned back to God through Jesus Christ. Now, You might be hearing that and going, Bernard, you bang on about this every week. And you're right, I do. But it has immense practical application because that's the question we must pass all of our parenting decisions through. How is this parenting decision meeting my child's greatest need? Leading them to Jesus 
and the forgiveness of sins, leading them back to God whose image they bear. How is my parenting shepherding my child's heart back to God? Through Jesus Christ alone. Second question, where is a child's greatest hope? Well, if that's the greatest need, where is their greatest hope? It's Jesus Christ, isn't it? God's desire for every married person is godliness. God's desire for every single person is godliness. God's desire for every child is godliness. Meeting God through Jesus Christ alone. And again, that is immensely practical for our parenting decisions. As we make decisions about what our children will do and how they'll fill their time and what they will focus on, are my parenting decisions leading them to Jesus? Is what I do and say as a parent or a grandparent even showing that Jesus is our greatest hope as people who need to be returned to God? Well, if that's the need and this is the hope, uh, what means does God give us for making this happen? Uh, God gives us two households that will help this happen. Uh, The first, the primary, the most important household is which one? The one of the mum and dad, isn't it? The one God designed originally. And that's the one God talks about in Deuteronomy 6. Next slide, please, Tim. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Uh, Let me just say, every child is enrolled in a discipleship program. A disciple is a wholehearted student follower. What discipleship program is your child enrolled in at home? What is the love they see? Because they will always be in some discipleship program. And this is the program that brings them to know and love Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself was enrolled in a program. Next one, please, Tim. Listen to Luke chapter 2. Then Jesus went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart. And listen to this. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and with people. That's Jesus at the age of 12. Jesus is enrolled in a discipleship program and the disciples are his mum and dad. And Jesus was brought to his father in heaven through their work. In fact, that's God's clear command to families now. Last one, Tim, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. God has this design, and everywhere you look in the Bible, God provides the resources. You want to know about how to help your children make wise decisions about money and work and creation and justice and injustice and politics? Read the book of Proverbs. If you want to help your child understand the limit of knowing lots of books and enjoying parties in this world, read the book of Ecclesiastes. If you want your child to know the goodness of human desire well looked after and rightly directed, read Song of Songs. If you want to know what it looks like to submit to the danger of greed, the falsity of good religion, the need to care for the poor, the widow, the orphan and the foreigner, read any prophet. If you want to know what it looks like to enjoy human intimacy, read Ephesians 5. If you want to show your kids how to treat people of other ethnic backgrounds and social classes, read Philemon. If you want to know the design for what it means to be a worker, an employer, an employee, read Ephesians and Colossians. If you want to know what it looks like to talk to any nation about Jesus, read Matthew 28. It's all there in God's design. So here's the question. Parents and grandparents... Are we reading that word with our kids? Are we talking to them about God the Father and Jesus the Saviour and the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, 
so they'll actually navigate the world God's way. And kids, kids, are we listening as the Bible's read to us? Are we listening to God's word as we hear it read and understanding? There's a second household, isn't there? And that's this household. (laughs) That's the household of God gathered together, just like that mob as they walked up the hill with Psalm 127. Who's welcome in this household? Any person's welcome in the door, aren't they? No matter their age, no matter their background, any child is welcome to sit with us, sing our songs, Hear our verses, eat our Mars bars, remember our memory verses, pray our prayers, have morning tea with us. Any child is welcome because Jesus said, come to me, these little ones, so that you can have your greatest need met. So I want to finish with this question. Are we singing Psalm 127 with our kids? Because when we do, we'll know about legacy as God designs it. The legacy that our kids need of meeting Jesus in Christ alone and being restored to God. The legacy of a house built so that it lasts forever. I want to close with a story about a man, I think, who's singing Psalm 127. He's a close mate of mine. He's got a PhD. He's owned his own consulting business. He now works as a high school teacher. He's got four kids, two girls in their 20s, two boys, one finished high school, one about to. I was chatting to him recently and he said, Bernard, I finally realised this. My job in life is to stand with my kids on judgment day and sing the praises of God. There's a man who sings Psalm 127. Do we sing Psalm 127 and think about our legacy? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. We've covered huge amounts like we seem to, and we give thanks for your clarity. Thanks for children as little image bearers of you. Thank you for the blessing they are. Thank you that we can recognise that we've passed on our image, the image of you broken in sin. Thank you that you sent your son in order to restore that. Father, please help us to build a legacy enabled by you that is standing with our children on the last day and singing your praises. Amen. Any quick questions? Roz, yep. Rod's Rod's has made yeah. So Rod's has made a really important comment. Don't think that there's an equal sign between salvation and reading the Bible with your kids every day. Okay, God's given us a design that works, but then every child must stand before God. Two Corinthians five verse ten and be judged on how they've dealt with Jesus on their own. And so I think that reaches a certain point. So I think it's a good comment to make. Uh, There's a pattern in the Bible of God's design for the family where children will be raised to know and love him. And then like every human being, those children must understand Jesus by God's grace alone and relate to him as an individual brought into a community. So just because you will do this with your child doesn't mean you have then put God in your debt and God will save them or that it's guaranteed. It is the primary means that God has given us, but each of our children must stand before God and answer for how they've dealt with Jesus in their own lives. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, do I? Yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a good observation. Uh, so it, people do things. Ah, oh, they're just being teenagers, or they're just innocent little children. Uh, you're right. They are, and we need to understand kids where they are in life, and the way hormones are working, and the way growth is working, and the way decision making works. But God's word's very clear that I was sinful from the time of conception. 
And so as a human being, I've taken on the image of God from Adam, but it's an image marred by human sin. That actually helps us deal with our kids rightly so that we actually deal with them as they really are. And so we always bring our kids before God and all of our children need to daily meet Jesus. Yeah. 